you who don't know me, you can see I'm a religious Jew, I'm a Chabadnik. Uh, I'm also a professor. Uh, so by standards of uh, religious Jews, this whole course is what we call apicorsis. Right? To look at Freud, Freud was, was wanted to be, he purposely wanted to be one of the great heretics, one of the great Jewish heretics uh, of the 20th century, and I think he succeeded. But at the same time, I think it's very, very valuable for religious Jews to look at Freud for many reasons. Well, when over the next six days, we'll see, you know, it'll become, I hope, clear why, why it is so valuable. But certainly intellectually, it's, it's, it's very, very important to understand who Freud was. Much of our world, believe it or not, is shaped by Freud, by Freud's ideas. I'll give you a simple example. If you've ever seen, uh, do you know the movie Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? It's a very American, you know, this Willy Wonka. You know Willy Wonka? Maybe you guys don't know it. If you have little kids, you know the book? Ah, okay. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, it's a trend in uh, modern Hollywood uh, to, when you tell the story of somebody, you usually tell the story of their childhood. Even when that wasn't there beforehand. In other words, Willy Wonka is just a, it's, it's a popular uh, children's story. Uh, in, in, it's an American story, obviously. Actually, it's British. The author was actually British. And there's an old version with Gene Wilder, which was famous for many years. And they made a new one not long ago with Johnny Depp. What I found very interesting is that in the new story, the new version with Johnny Depp, the, the director takes pains to show you the childhood of the main character who's traumatized, which, is, which shows you how we think today. We used to think, you know, you tell the story if somebody's an adult, uh, and if somebody's traumatized, whatever, we don't worry about it. Today, you cannot tell the story of somebody without telling their backstory, their childhood story. We want to know why are they this way. Uh, another example, actually, is um, we have Judge Krauss with us. Uh, you, you know, in American uh, legislative history, there was a famous lawyer named Clarence Darrow who, who introduced the idea, legal proceedings, of, of arguing from, from, from the standpoint of the uh, accused's psychological makeup. In other words, people used to go to court, you say, look, this guy is a criminal. You say, this, what did he do? What was the crime that he committed? He did this and this in crime. Okay, if he's a criminal, you put him in jail. Clarence Darrow was the first lawyer to say, well, wait a minute. It's true that he's a criminal. It's true that he did the crime. But let's look at his childhood. Let's look at the circumstances of what this person came from. If you understand the childhood of this person, you're not going to be so harsh. You understand that there was extenuating circumstances that caused this person to do this crime. And therefore, this person should not be put in jail, but should be put in a mental asylum, in a psychiatric ward. That way of arguing is a very modern way. It's a relatively modern argument to say, well, let's look at his childhood. And of course, under the influence of Freud, the whole 20th century and us today, we still think that way. We're not so, we're generally, I mean, some, you know, some of us judge quickly, but most of us understand that every, even the worst criminal, even Hitler, you have to look at his childhood. Why did he behave this way? What happened in his home? And this way of thinking comes from Freud. Freud was a, affected almost single-handedly a revolution in the way we look at human beings. And of course, the way we look at religion. For Freud, religion was not just a very important question, he wrote, you should know, before he wrote a book on Moses at the end, he wrote two very important books. We're going to look at one of them today, I hope. Totem and Taboo was the first book. And then he wrote a second book called Future of an Illusion and a few essays. So definitely religion was an important question, an important problem for Freud. But we'll see, I think, I hope you'll see uh, together, is that it was much more than a problem. For him, psychology, the whole of psychology, begins with religion as a problem. And even if you're not religious, it's still a problem. Many, you know, in Israel, for example, we always talk about the Dati Chiloni divide. There's, there's religious people and there's secular Jews. It's true on the surface, there are people who wear a kippah, put on tefillin, eat kosher, right? And then there's Jews who don't care about anything, right? 
on a deeper psychological level, it's not that simple. Even a person who is completely chiloni has ways of thinking that is really a secular form of a religion. Even though he would never say, I believe in God. You say, no, I don't believe in God at all. It's true, but you, the way you think, the categories of your thinking could still be quite religious. Um, and this is what Freud was interested in, in, uh, in deconstructing. Um, okay, before we look at the book, I, as my students know, I, my, I prefer to teach by reading. I'm a little bit Talmudic this way. I like to open up the book and read together and examine and discuss it. Uh, but before we do look at Totem and Taboo, I hope we'll get around to it today in the, in the second part of the class, as is also my habit, I like to begin with a little bit of biography to tell you a little bit about, just a bit of information about who, who Freud was. Sigismund Schlomo Freud is born in Freiburg in Moravia, which is in uh, the Czech Republic. Today it's called Pribor. His parents are both from Galicia. Their parents, of course, and their par grandparents are quite religious. Uh, they're less religious, but these are Jews, like any Haskalah Jew from that period. Uh, Freud's father, for example, read and, and understood Hebrew very well. And even, we'll see in a second, he actually even wrote, uh, he was able to write in Hebrew. So Freud, his family moves when he's four years old to Vienna. The Freuds, by the way, they have, he has five siblings. He's the oldest of six children, and he is the oldest son of his mother, so he, he as happens in many situations, and he, Freud is the first person to explain this, he has a special connection with his mother. This happens, it's very often, right, that a mother's, uh, like myself, I'm a firstborn boy, very often mothers and their firstborn boys have this, uh, what Freud himself called the family romance. There's almost a quasi-romantic relationship, and she always would refer to him as my, my golden Elzigi, my golden Sigmund. So that family moves because of financial difficulties. Uh, Freud's father, Yaakov, has a difficult time in Moravia, so he moves the family to Vienna. And Freud spends most of his life in Vienna. This is a fascinating document uh, that was uh, made famous by an American-Israeli historian, we might have ch a chance to talk about him, named Yerushalmi, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, wrote a book called Freud's Moses. In, in, in this book he discusses this, this Tanakh that Freud's father used to teach little Zygmunt. When Shlomo was a little boy, the first language that he learned to read was Hebrew. His father Yaakov taught him to read Hebrew in Tanakh, in the Tanakh, in the family Bible, which was known as the Philipson Bible. It was a German and Hebrew Bible. And when Freud was 35 years old, his father gave him a copy, this, this very same Bible. It was bound, it was freshly bound in, in leather. And his father wrote, Freud's father wrote this dedication in Hebrew. Right, this is not an Israeli, this is a Moravian Jew who's writing his son, when his son is 35, a text in Hebrew. And it's not just written in Hebrew, it's in, in a style called Melitza. Melitza is a style where you take different psukim, you take different verses from, Chum, from Chumash and from Tanakh, and you write you know, a dedication to your son. It starts off in, in your 35th year of life, so on and so on. Um, and which raises an interesting question. If Freud, at the age of 35, is getting a present from his father with a dedication in Hebrew, can Freud actually read it? Presumably, when he was a boy, he could. But maybe he forgot it. I, I was born in Israel, but over the years, I, I forgot my Hebrew. I had to work very hard to regain it. So it's possible that he did understand it. But in any case, it's interesting that his father would even write a dedication to his son in Hebrew, um, when he, when, uh, in 1891, uh, when, when he is, sorry, yes, yes, in 1891, when his son is, is 35. In um, 1881, just going back now, 
going very quickly, I'm just going to uh, just the highlights of Freud's life. Freud, of course, studies medicine. He does very, very well in high school. He's an exemplary student. He learns many languages. He learns how to read Shakespeare in English, and he learns French. Uh, he learns Latin and Greek, of course, uh, which is standard. Uh, so he was a polyglot. He knew many languages. He was always interested in history and mythology. Uh, he, was, he started to study law, actually. Uh, initially, he was enrolled in, as a, in a study of law, but then he switched to medicine. And in 1881, he gets his medical degree from the University of Vienna. And in 1882, the following year, he begins his career as a physician in the General Hospital of Vienna. Uh, he does a little bit of research also, especially on neurology, of course. He becomes very interested in the brain. And uh, he publishes various articles on neurology, not on, there is no such thing as psychology yet. So he's, he is studying the brain, the actual physical brain. And in 1885, as a result of his publications, he is engaged at the University of Vienna as a, what's called a privatdozent. Which, which is a lecturer in neuropathology uh, who doesn't get paid. At that time, if you're a docent, you don't get paid a salary, but it's a great honor, of course, to be Professor Freud, not just Dr. Freud, but Professor Freud at the University of Vienna. In 1886, after four years of dating, he marries uh, Martha Bernays, I get, I'm not sure how it's pronounced in German, Bernays or Bernays, who comes from uh, Hamburg in Germany. Martha's grandfather actually was the chief rabbi of Hamburg, but she is still a little bit religious, uh, not as religious as her grandfather, obviously, but she is religious enough that when, they, when they're dating, Freud has to warn her. He says, you should know that when we're going to get married, there's going to be pork in the house. We're going to eat chazir. And she, of course, she's upset by it. She's a relatively religious Jew. But Freud is very adamant. He's very insistent that he will not be a religious Jew. In fact, he did not want to have a chuppah. He insisted, I do not want to get married in a chuppah. Uh, and uh, he, was, he even wanted to convert uh, to, to Christianity to avoid having a chuppah, but his, uh, his uh, older mentor, uh, Fleece, who's also Jewish, convinces him, it's too much trouble to convert, don't worry about it, you can still be a good chiloni, you can still be a good secular Jew, uh, and you'll convince your wife, and of course he does. They, in the home, they, they, I don't know, I'm, I'm assuming they did eat pork, I don't think they, they d did not raise their children in a very religious way. Although Freud, as we'll see, always has a certain a deep, deep identification with Judaism, but is not by no means a religious Jew. They have six children. Here is a picture of, of uh, five of them. Her sister, by the way, this is uh, Freud's wife. Her sister gets divorced and then she moves into the household and, and lives with them. This, by the way, this little girl here, it turns out to be Freud's little favorite girl, uh, whose name is Anna. Anna Freud became one of the great psychologists in her own right uh, of the 20th century. She specialized in childhood psychology. It, she, was, she was, the I would say, one of the two first great female psychologists was Anna Freud and Melanie Klein. Both of them uh, lived in England. Uh, both, of, both of them Jewish. Of course, all... All the original psychologists were Jewish, right? All of them, except for one, which we'll look at in a second. <laughs> um, and it's, it's definitely not an accident. Freud's uh, senior mentor, one of his mentors in Vienna, Josef Breuer, who of course is also Jewish, uh, they work together in his early, the early part of his career and he publishes, they publish together uh, First, the first big major study that Freud published, uh, studies on hysteria, which are based on their analysis of a lady named Anna O, who's also Jewish. 
Amo is the pseudonym of Bertha Pappenheim, who was a very important Jewish feminist in that period. She did a lot, uh, in particular, to help uh, Jewish prostitutes, believe it or not, at that time. Uh, was, a, was really a, an important political figure in, in her time, but she, she suffered from what at that time was called hysteria. Today, I don't think we use that, the word hysteria anymore. And so her case, the Anna O case, becomes the basis of their great work on hysteria, uh, namely Freud and, and Josef Breuer. Then in 1899, Freud publishes his own first magnum opus, the Traum Deutung, the Interpretation of Dreams. This is a massive book uh, where Freud analyzes himself. He says, he often says, you know, the only way I, we can do psychology is if I tell you my own dreams. I'm going to uh, talk about cases that I've examined, but also about my, my own case. And uh, Freud, of course, analyzes dreams as a gateway, as a, a, a door into the unconscious. Uh, the language of the unconscious is a language that is revealed, well, actually, just to go back to uh, Breuer, Breuer was very influential on Freud in introducing him to the method of, of hypnosis. He would hypnotize patients and the patient would speak under hypnosis Anna O oh was such a patient, and the, under hypnosis, the patient would reveal certain aspects of what came to be called their subconscious. And then later, Freud himself would ask his patients to discuss their dreams, and then he would analyze their dreams to reveal what's going on in their, in their subconscious. If Freud, by 1902, uh, 1902 in Vienna, he started a, a regular Wednesday meeting in his apartment on Berggasse. By the way, if, if you, you're going to Vienna, I assume, and make a visit, no? So it's interesting, if you go to, to Vienna, it's interesting to visit his apartment. It's empty, but it's still interesting because Freud moved to England. So all of his stuff is in England, but on Berggasse 19, in the 9th district, um, it, it is an interesting place to visit. Um, so there, he, the, all the great psychologists of that period assembled, and again, everybody in this picture is Jewish. In this picture, the only one who is missing this is this here is uh, Shandor Ferenczi from uh, Budapest, uh, but all the other ones are Jews: Otto Rank, Karl Abraham, Max Ettingen. Uh, sorry, except for Ernest Jones is not. He's an, uh, an American. In the beginning of psychology, uh, it was an actual huge problem for Freud that he was worried that psychology would be known as the Jewish science because all of them were Jews. Freud was actually in incredibly excited when the great non-Jewish psychologist joined their ranks in the lower right hand over here. I don't know if you know who this is. Uh, from Switzerland, Zurich, it was Carl Jung. So Jung, that was the, the token goy, the token goy in the circle of Jewish psychologists. And Fro this was very important for Freud because uh, it, he felt that this would give legitimacy to psychology, which it did. It had that effect. You may, may or may not know that you know, Hitler had a personal hatred of Freud and psychology. He felt that the whole of psychology was a Jewish poison. That, you know, uh, these Jewish psychologists from Vienna, all they talk about is sex and sexual perversions. Hitler himself was a sexual pervert, of course, but he didn't like to talk about it. Uh, so he felt that the Nazis felt that, that psychology was, this, was one of the many ways that Jews pollute uh, the European mind. Uh, so uh, the fact that, that Jung uh, became a very important Jung is probably the second most famous psychologist after Freud. So this was a very big hop, as we say, uh, for, for Freud. Questions, by the way? I'm rushing here. Uh, no? Okay. Then, in, uh, he wrote a few books. I'm only going to highlight, uh, the, the, I mentioned the Traumdeutung, the Interpretation of Dreams. 
I'm only, I'm only going to mention two other ones. Uh, this is the one that we're going to look at today. Um, a totem uh, and taboo, uh, which came out in 1913. There's a cute story, I think it's told by one of the psychologists, I think it's Otto Rank mentions how when, when totem and, and taboo came out, it was a big splash. It was a huge revolution in, in the way people looked, looked at human beings, at human history. And he mentions that they were once, that Freud was sitting with his, uh, the inner circle, this is the, these guys here, in a restaurant in Vienna, and there happened to be Freud, and there was 12 students of Freud eating at a, a dinner. Uh, so Zoltan, you already know where this is going. <laughs> and he said they really, they really felt that this was the Last Supper. You know, it was uh, Freud and his 12 disciples with the new gospel. This was the, the, the new gospel of the 20th century, which was finally destroying the, the religion. Put an end to, to religion. Totem and taboo, as we'll see, is an, as a, an attempt to understand where religion really comes from in, in, the, in, in general, but of course with a focus on Western civilization, on, Jude, on the Judeo-Christian tradition. In 1938, I'm jumping forward now, big leap, <clears throat> 1938, as you can tell, it's a where well, we're very, very close. One year before the Second World War, a Jewish, the Jews of Vienna, like the Jews of Europe in general, are feeling the pressure and the heat. And uh, at this point, Freud's books are being burned, among other books, uh, by the Nazis. And then Freud is one of the smarter Jews who understands that it's time to leave Vienna. And so he packs up his bags and he goes to London. After 78 years of living in Vienna, he's already a man advanced in years. He's 81, I guess, uh, 82. He's 82 years old and he moves to, uh, he moves to London. And, uh, you know, he finds a lot of comfort in, being, in, in the London scene. He's welcomed, of course. He's very famous at this point. Um, this is... As you can see, he's sitting there rather infirm, quite infirm. But even though he's in the last years of his life, he does have enough energy to put together one last book, which is the book that we are going to focus on, his book on Moses. The Roman Moses und die monotheistische Religion. The man Moses and the monotheistic religion. The monotheistic religion is of course Judaism. He doesn't call it Judaism. He could have called it der Mann Moses und Judentum. Why does he call it Judentum? He refers to it as the monotheistic religion. Obviously, Christianity and Islam are also monotheistic religions, but and he does deal with Christianity in the book, not so much with Islam, uh, but the focus is of course on Moses as the founder of the monotheistic religion. Earlier on, it's not the first time that Freud wrote about Moses. There's a very interesting little essay that he wrote, uh, I forget which year, uh, an essay completely devoted to Michelangelo's statue of Moses, which is in the picture here. We have a that includes that, yeah. And it's a brilliant little essay. It's really, it's, a, it's an essay in art history more than psychology where he, he analyzes at great length the statue, just the statue, trying to figure out what, what does the statue actually mean? What was Michelangelo trying to say with the statue? And there was a real machloket, you know, there was a real, uh, the, the art historians had arguments about what, what, what moment is this? Uh, most of them agree, by the way, that the moment that Michelangelo is capturing is uh, when Moshe Rabbeinu has come down from, from Mount Sinai, and he sees that the people have built the Egel Azav, the golden calf, and he's angry. So that's when you see his face has this expression of, of anger. Uh, but Freud gives an interesting, you know, as you, you know, the story, of course, he gets angry. He takes the luchot, he takes the tablets, and he smashes them, he breaks them. Freud, Freud begins with the question, why is Michelangelo, in this painting, why are the tablets not broken? Why is he holding on to them? They should be broken. Um, and he gives a whole interpretation 
based on that, on the fact that the tablets are not broken. And so what exactly is this moment? Apparently Freud, he visited Rome a few times, and every time he visited Rome, he would walk down to the, uh, I forget what it's called, uh, Sultan, do you know the, the what is it? The? Capella? No, La Sistine. Uh, yeah, that's where the Michelangelo, that's the Sistine Chapel. No, it's a, tr it's a small church. Um, ah, doesn't matter. Anyway, Moses is in the church. It was built, it was commissioned by the Pope at that time, Pope Julius, I believe, II. Um, and it, wasn't, he, it was one of several statues, so Michelangelo didn't get to finish it. In any case, when Freud, when Freud would visit Rome, every time he would visit Rome, he would go down to the church and sit in front of the statue for hours just studying it, he was mesmerized by this statue. Uh, and then, so this is 1938, and the following year, Freud dies. Uh, only one year later, after having completed the Moses and Monotheism, which is actually published after he dies, uh, he dies, interestingly enough, of, of buckle or jaw cancer. Why jaw cancer? Because he smoked. <laughs> it's all life. Cigars. He, cigars, yeah. He took up smoking at the age of 27 and continued smoking his whole life and then, uh, and, and then contracted the jaw, cancer of the jaw. In, uh, I think it was 1934, he already had signs of it and he passes away in 1939 in England, um, ha having lived there basically for a, two years, the, the, last, the last two years of his life. And, and the, muse the museum, and I think his house is a museum today, his house in England, which has, uh, I haven't visited, I, I've been to the, in Vienna, but not the English one. The English one is apparently more interesting because he collected a lot of art, a lot of uh, avodah zara. He collected a lot of little statues from Egypt, from South America, from everywhere. Little gechkes, you know, little idols from everywhere. He was fascinated by this. Of course, we, you know, to like li little totemic uh, little totemic entities. Um, okay, that's that's Freud in a in, in a nutshell. Yeah, sure. yeah, he left, yeah. He left after the Russians. He, he left me after the just after the Anschluss. Yeah, the Anschluss. When was the Anschluss? Anschluss is the the Russian Revolution. Yeah, yeah. In 1938, it was also 1938. Yeah. April 1938. Yeah. Actually, I read that. Yeah, <laughs> because he was so famous. That's very funny. Yeah, well, he was a very influential man. Yeah, I mean, if Freud had stayed in Vienna, would they have killed him? Of course. Yeah, for sure. Even though, despite his fame, despite uh, yeah. But before. Yeah, not exactly. In 1939, nobody was. Uh, well, no no Jews. What? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Jews were not yet killed. As soon as the Germans were occupied, they used very, very hard for them. Yeah. But, yeah. But most of the. I, I don't remember the Viennese. Most of the deport, deportations happened, obviously, later. I mean, the major deportations begin in 1942. Right, the major Auschwitz is only built in 1942. Yeah, Kristallnacht, yeah, yeah, yeah. 